This whole 60 year evolution of the sport and the brand, we always included the people that we were dealing with as we went along and, and we've always had a good rapport and a good friendship. They, they are family. Someday I'll follow you away It may take a century before we reach LA Stuck in a dream I can't wake up Clear as day and slightly vain You bring me secret love Tremble in hand Tremble in hand I want it back, I want it back, I want it back My name is Bing Copeland. I was born uh, March 22, 1936. The name Bing came about because my actual name, I was named after my father and my grandfather. It's Herbert Bingham Copeland III is my official name. And when I was two years old, my babysitters didn't want to call me Herbie. So they shortened my middle name and they all started calling me Bing. And it's been that way ever since. The way it started for me is one day I was at the beach and I looked down towards the pier and I saw, saw the guys riding boards. Turns out it was like Velzy and some of the other older guys. In those days, the, they were just planks and, and uh, paddle boards. While I was uh, watching, this kid came up and sat next to me, and turns out it was Greg Knoll. That's how we met. I was 13, I think he was 12. I think there was Bing and me and Buzzy Bent were the only kids under, you know, 18 from Santa Barbara to, to uh, Windensea. Just the fact that you can sleep on the beach all summer long, leave your sleeping bag there, nobody screwed around with your stuff, kind of tells you a little bit about what it was like, you know. We were, we were good friends, pretty much like brothers. We would get a ride with older guys to San Onofre or Malibu or Rincon. And then when I was 19, I left to go to Hawaii to surf, and Greg went the year before that. He just went for a trip and came back. I went over and stayed for two years, joined the Coast Guard, and there was like three years that we didn't really see each other except maybe once in a while in Hawaii when, during the winter when he would come over to visit. He was living with Rick Stoner. You know, they became real good friends too and went in the Coast Guard together. And uh, the first day we surfed Waimea, uh, Bing was out. When I got out of Hawaii, we, I was sailing on a yacht. We went to Tahiti and uh, Fiji and Samoa and ended up in Auckland, New Zealand. And him and Rick, incidentally, they introduced surfing to uh, New Zealand. Basically, we got off the boat in Auckland, New Zealand because we found surf. We came in, there was 10 or 15 guys neck deep in the water going, give me a go, mate, you know? They all wanted to try our boards. All they had was surf skis, you know, with the big 14-foot boards or the big scoop of minnows. 
that's when this it went to me. I went, hey, why don't we build some? So we made friends with a local there, Peter Byers. <clears throat> he took us into Auckland and we found materials. All we could find was styrofoam. And we built probably a half a dozen boards on the beach. We were using a cheese grater to shape the styrofoam. They were kind of crude, but they were, they were okay. And I kept remember thinking to myself, you know, I can do this. So when we came back, we, we got into it, and that's when we opened the first shop on the Strand. That was 1959. We were partners in the beginning. It was Bing and Rick surfboards. After the first year, he decided he wanted to be a permanent lifeguard, so uh, I bought him out. And uh, then it just sort of snowballed from there. You know, in the beginning, didn't worry about advertising and promoting and teams and this and that. I just built boards for the guys that wanted them. I got big enough I could open a sales shop. J Jacobs had one on the highway. Greg Knoll had one on the highway. I had to have one on the highway. You know, they didn't have, they weren't full of clothing. Yeah, all we had was surfboards in the shops. They were pretty cool, actually. <laughs> It just turned out that we were all friends. Hap and myself and Greg and Dewey and Rick. We went to parties at night and in the daytime we tried to outsell each other in surfboards. We all partied, we all drank together, we chased a lot of the same girls and uh, it's, I, I never knew another business where guys could stay as friendly as we did. We were the South Bay and that was pretty much it. We could sell as many as we could make in those days. Popularity, it was out of our hands. It just, I like to say that there was some formula, but there really isn't. It was just something that grew out of the surf scene. I think it was the magazine, and that's how the word got spread. We started getting phone calls from the East Coast. It wasn't like the West Coast. They didn't have any shapers, so they had to get all our boards from, from us guys. So there was times where Bing and I and Rick couldn't make them fast enough. I was running on a night crew. Bing would come in with order cards and had blanks lined up along the wall, and he'd just stick on the order cards. And then Bennington and I would start mowing foam. We were doing like 40 boards a day between the two of us. At one point there in the mid-60s, I swear there was more boards built in Hermosa Beach than any other place in the world. You know, you're just building, you're building the name as you go. I didn't set out saying, I'm gonna build a team of great surfers and board builders and stuff, it just sort of, evolve. More than a surfboard, you know, being a social scene, which we didn't really realize we were doing at the time, but it turns out that's what we did. Once we got into having surf team members, it was more of a family feeling. Donald Takayama came to me and wanted to work with me and build his own model, and it worked out very well. We didn't have models up until then. That was our very first model of any kind. And then he brought David Nueva in. He said, well, why don't we build a David Nueva nose rider? He's a good nose rider with the idea of he wanted to do a concave in the nose. And so I was all for it. He became kind of like a, like a movie star. He was just a natural. He just had so much style, so much grace. Being 
He was the finest man I've ever known. Bennington and I busted our butts, but he paid us well and treated us well. He was grateful. We were doing the Nose Rider, and we did the uh, Lightweight, which was really popular. And then that was about the time that we got Brewer. I was building Bings at Surfline Hawaii, and uh, the Pipeliner was the first minigun, so to speak. Jock Sutherland and, and Jeff Hackman were, were riding primarily the Pipeliners. It started off the shortboard evolution. In the early 70s, there was a, a definite shift for shorter boards. We did get complacent as a group in California, and the Aussies woke us up to the fact that things were changing. So I will admit that. But uh, we adapted pretty quickly. As the industry and the sport progressed, it was fun to be a part of it. We didn't plan a year ahead. We just went with what's going on at the time. And we had to find the right people and to have your, basically have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Keith Paul was a great shaper. He was good at innovating and uh, kind of bringing his style, and I guess the Australian style at the time, in, into our uh, line of surfboards. All the girls loved him because he was a good looking guy and the guys loved him because he was a great surfer. And, and Keith was such a personality. Rolf came to me because of his father, James Arness. He surfed the same kind of style that Keith did. His power surfing at the time, when he won the contest in Australia, was what was needed. The Australians at that time had gone too short, and he had the right equipment <laughs> that we made. Duke Boyd came in, and uh, when we would come up with a new model, he would come up with a new logo. Suddenly we were advertising mavens, you know? <laughs> Before we were just trying to catch a wave. He and his artist would design the artwork. Uh, Bob Donfest, I think it was. He was unbelievably delighted. I owe him a lot for urging me to go in directions that I wasn't ready to go. I was busy building the day-to-day -day boards and he was thinking ahead. No one knew what to do in surfing. I mean, the advertising all went in different kinds of ways, but it was definitely an indication of the mindset of the surfers of that day. I did have full trust in him. He was a big part of my success, I think. After the 60s, into the 70s, the world was now changing. It didn't have that, that, that innocence. Surfers, of course, were the leaders of all that and said, listen, I'm going to go surfing and I ain't going to go to work. And they, that ended up being a national problem. <laughs> but in essence, it was really true. They led a revolution. Because of uh, those drug influences, basically, and the hippie influences. Uh, not that I disagreed with all that stuff, but it just it seemed to lead surfing and our customer base in a, in a, in a bad direction. I could see my interest slipping away. As the demand was for shorter and shorter boards, we adapted to it, and, w and I think we did a good job. I think we did probably as good or better than our competitors did, but I could still see that it, it wasn't going in a good direction for my longevity in the business. Some of the older surfers quit surfing, so it, we felt it in the volume of our sales dropping. It was a troubling time, and we tried to adapt as well as we could. And that's when the Campbell brothers walked in the door. 
We were part of that garage movement. People were just buying materials cheap and making boards, and since, the, since boards had gotten shorter, they were easier to make, and it was becoming a bit of a threat to the industry. This is the, where we started shaping surfboards. That's it, right there. In 1970, I probably would have been 15 years old and Malcolm would have been 19. So it was only two years into messing around that we developed the bond. That was our eureka moment. It's three fins. Archaeological evidence, <laughs> resin from surfboards we made in 1973. The first turn that I did on that board was the speed out of the turn and the control was so dramatically different than the wide tail, you know, single fins. And so we knew right away that we, you know, we had, you know, this was worth pursuing. Through a credible manufacturer. It was Bing that responded. They had long hair, but they weren't really the hippie kind of thing, you know, they were, they were, they were just nice, wholesome kids. And they had an eight millimeter movie they wanted to show us. And we pulled up and we had a couple of our hand-shaped bonders on top and we had Super 8 film projector and we had some still photography. So we went into the office and these two young guys had an eight millimeter movie and it was pretty impressive to say the least. For that time, we were doing stuff on the waves that you didn't normally see. They just said, we should make some of these. That same day, we went into the shaping room and we each shaped one. Once they got a thumbs up from the riders, then, you know, being said, well, okay, we'll give it a go. The first reaction of people was, oh, it's just another gimmick. Turned out to be a pretty good gimmick. Showing the confidence in the design changed the course of our lives. It was a good thing to do for the entire industry because it, uh, it was a jump start when a jump start was needed. You know, a lot of manufacturers like to be, it was them, you know, I don't feel that way. I think, it, I always feel it was us. I'm proud of the fact that, that we did the Bonzer and, and made it popular. Uh, we really only did it for like a year uh, because it, it was about that time that I was gonna move on. In 1974, when I realized that there just wasn't enough volume to run a, a big factory, I started looking for other opportunities. You, know, you either downsize back into your garage or move on to something else. I mean, it's, it really wasn't an option. I made a deal with uh, Larry Gordon to license the Bing brand. The day that I got, sat everybody down in the factory and told them what my plan was, what I decided to do, was difficult because they were all family. Just looking at these photos brings back a lot of memories. It was just a really good time. We really got along as a group and we made a lot of really cool surfboards. This is my record book number one. It was uh, January 1st, 1961. Rick Irons, the Irons family. John Van Hammersfield, the artist. All the rest of these, up to book number 15, show all the boards we built, the dates we built them, and who we built them for, what shop we built them for. It's really neat when you can connect somebody with their original order. At the time being sold to GNS, GNS was the biggest manufacturer 
in California. Mike Eaton was, uh, he said, I'll be glad to move to San Diego and work in the Larry's factory. And they continued on with the Bonzer down there. So I had a loyalty to Bing, and so I came down there and was shaping boards. The credibility stayed with the Bonzer, with the Mike Eaton legacy. Mike was considered at that time one of the top shapers in the world. Bing was gone out of the picture. We just rode it along for as long as we could. For 15 years or so, I really didn't give much thought to the surfboard business. As far as I was concerned, I was over it. When the licensing agreement with Larry Gordon ended, Mike Eaton wanted to just take the, the brand, the name, and he still kept sell, building and selling Bings when people wanted them. Well, the demand for the Bings had slowed down dramatically. I was a, a shaper, not a marketer. It was sort of dwindling, yeah, it was. My fire was kind of going, going out. I was fading. Yeah, I, I think I shaped something on the order of 20,000 things. And then he mentioned he had a young guy that was wanting to get in and, and take over. And I just said, oh, well, that's great fine with me. And so he passed it on to Matt Calvani, a young, young guy that still had the fire in his belly. I was surfing at this little beach break spot that we liked that was just uh, about 20 minutes from our, our house in Baja. This rental car drove up with two shortboard kids in the car. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, uh, like Bing Copeland, you know, just from like watching old movies, 60s movies. This one guy was looking at me and, uh, and finally said, are you Bing? Are you Bing Copeland? And I said, yeah, I am. And I go, hey, if you need anybody to make your surfboards, like, I'd be happy to, you know? You know, and he was like, gave me a look like, huh. Right away, I knew he had something going. I liked him. I had a feeling that there was something there. I said, but Mike Eaton is building my boards. I would never take it away from him. Uh, it, but I will ask him. So I stopped with Mike's and told him about Matt. And he said, great, send him down. I'll line him up with all the decals. And Mike Eaton gave him a big stack of logos and just goes, here you go. <laughs> and I was like, cool. Wow, it's like he just handed me the, the legacy right there, you know, in a box. <laughs> Then Bing goes, it's all yours. He, he just seemed to be mini me. <laughs> you know, he was the perfect guy for the job. And I, you know, I was impressed with his quality. I was impressed with his shaping. I was impressed with his understanding of both short boards and long boards. I was so, you know, enamored by the, the boards from the 60s and 70s and the, the shaping style. These guys had learned the, the craft, like it was like an art form. The heritage brands, like I really thought that was the way to go because they had all that, that history and that craftsmanship and I could just and become part of the, that history, you know, and keep that legacy going. But it was like, okay, now I got this brand, like, I have to do something with it. Being at the time when I got it, it was sort of like this pristine gem. It just hadn't been stepped on, because I had saw other heritage brands you know, 
like guys were building them and then poof. When you mentioned Bing, it was like everybody thought good things. Something would always come to their mind like, oh, the Brewer Pipeliner or, or you know, Donald Takayama or, or I had a Dave Nueva nose rider or, and it was like, or I had a Bonzer that was just went on and on and on and I was just like overwhelmed like the potential. Uh, and I was like, wow, how do I like make this work? Bing was more like collector's boards at that point. Late 90s, early 2000s, like I was getting scoffed at for riding twin fins and wide point forward boards and single fins and long boards. Like everybody was riding rockered out slow thrusters. Linking up with Matt specifically as a shaper and with Bing, the timing was like impeccable because Matt was the catalyst that like got it going again. You just saw this incredible man with this vision and an unbelievable work ethic and just engineering and design theory that was like next level. I just said, this is, this is the guy. He's gonna be the guy that helped, you know, to help me uh, resurrect it. So that's what Matt and I really set out to do was like update the brand, have it feel timeless but modern at the same time. So like kind of the transition of, of the brand, you know, and really starting to work on the smaller boards. I think that's what Chris was pushing me into doing, challenging me as a shaper to get out of that paradigm where I was like a shortboard shaper here and then I was a longboard shaper here. I really didn't blend the two. We can make these boards and uh, we can reinvent them and make them better. Like it was a clear to find, you know, line in the sand where I just said Bing is the brand that I'm gonna make into a brand again. At that point we, we realized that the future was in Bing. Through my artistic kind of creative thought process and the way I work, we just started like naturally working on new board models, working on new lambs. It was really effortless with Chris because he's one of the few guys I've ever had as a team writer that it was just like when he explained what he wanted, I knew exactly what he wanted. Chris being an artist, and being an incredible surfer. And I think Matt and Chris work together just like I work together with uh, Bendixson and Eaton and Duke Boyd and all the other people that I brought. They, they have the same, kind of the same vibe going with each other that we had back in the 60s. When Matt took it over, he didn't just go off and, and build his own designs. He took our original boards and reproduced them and improved on them. And, but he always kept the same feel that the Bing brand had. You know, and then, and then a year later, he uh, was introduced by Hap Jacobs to uh, Jacobs Surf Team gal, which happened to be Margaret. He ended up marrying her and she became a partner with him in the business. Quite honestly, the two of them, they are a complete package that, you know, they're carrying on the tradition of 
the Bing surfboard that I started and they're bringing it into the new era. He would tell me about like the challenges of kind of running the business and building the boards. I mean, he was for the most part a one man show. I would walk into the factory, he would be holding the cordless phone, be talking to an account, like trying to sell surfboards while like finishing a surfboard and I'm like, wow, that can't be easy, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, I was a business consultant, so I, I guess like I was a little bit more knowledgeable about like operational stuff. She was like super organized and she's like, okay, I'll, I'll like run your business for six months and just cleaned everything up, you know, made a system and like started running it like a business. And uh, I was like, wow, this is great. Eventually she just stayed, you know. Both our dreams were fulfilled sort of through it. Hey Jeff, how's it going? Looks good. Demo, right? Yeah. Cool. Hey Ed, good morning. Hi, honey. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm in the storage closet. <laughs> uh, hot coach? Looks good. Pin line design that goes around the deck bag. I got an AO seeker. Wants the double stacked lamb. It's about, like, you know, loving what you do. And uh, most of our team riders, when they come in, it's like they just join the family. They're all part of the creative process. All of a sudden we had this like global team which was kind of cool like there's these people representing the brand in all corners of the world touching lives and connecting with people and that feedback is invaluable and then their friendships are invaluable like that's definitely one of the most rewarding parts these friends who became ambassadors After you put enough energy in any project, you like want to see it succeed and you want to see the vision stay on the right course. So it was really natural to like have my friends get involved. And uh, I started getting these great short boards from Matt, especially the fish um, twin fin boards. And Dave was just like, oh, let me, let me try that. I've got to get my hands on it. And he tried one and I never got it back. When you're surfing with buddies, you just swap boards. Chris and I being able to do that through lots of surf time together in Australia and Indo and America and stuff, and all of a sudden you've got this whole new strain of surfboard that's grown out of these friendships. And it's just a neat thing about surfing. People like Bing and Calvino and Dick Van, Gary, all these different cats, they come up with an idea, but it's a blend of ideas that have come from all kinds of people and places and times. And the neat thing with this whole network is the sharing of it.
like Dave come into the folds and him and Matt to start to get to work together and play around and Dave's great like that like he's worked with so many legends in his time you know and he's open to trying new things and he's you get something under his feet and you see whether it works or it doesn't work and if it works then you see like how, how far out it could go. Surfing for me has always been really personal. I just like to surf the way I like to surf and um, have chosen over and over throughout the years to um, feel my own way through it. You know there's an endless variety of boards at your disposal if you have an imagination. team is more of like not so much like their ability how good they are a surfer and obviously that that's part of it but you know what they contribute to you know to the world I guess and to surfing community at large. Coming across like empowered women like Lauren Hill and Melly and just powerful surfers and powerful spokespeople. So Chris first started coming to Australia and spending time with Dave and Dave and I slowly became attached at the hip. So Chris really didn't have any other choice but to accept me into the friend group. <laughs> She was traveling with us at the time and I was just tripping out on like how graceful and how good of a surfer Lauren was, um, especially longboarding at that point. She just had this beautiful grace and this like really feminine strength. Through her like voice as a surfer, she's been able to like go way beyond surfing and that's great because it's good to have a different perspective for young ladies. It's really important to me to support surfboard making as a craft um, and I feel so fortunate to have gotten to be pulled into this family of being, you know, with Matt and Margaret who have so much integrity in the way that they do business and so much passion for watering the seeds of surfing culture.
longboarding hasn't been so much a part of popular culture until quite recently. Women who were longboarding like myself, we didn't feel like we had to mimic the way men were doing it. Um, so there was a lot more room for individuality and interpreting our own lines. Margaret's presence at Bing in particular has been a big part of bolstering a generation of women who longboard, um, you know, supporting us and bringing us into um, the heart of surf culture and really validating women's surfing, women's longboarding in a way that, you know, might not have been the same had she not been in that role. I think she has made a huge difference in the last 10, 20 years. First and foremost, like Matt has never made me feel uncomfortable and you know he gave me my place in that business from day one. But at the same time, it's kind of a nod to the history of Shapers Wives. You know, the Conley Copelands and the Pat Jacobses and the Laura Knowles and the Caroline Webbers. I mean these women, they they ran those businesses. There's so much respect for the women who made this industry. Possible. Having Bing Copeland involved in the brand to this day, after all the amazing people he's been involved with, it's just like, it's special. I don't think anybody has this situation in the world. Like He is like the most frothing grum. To have him be involved is so, it's just such an honor and I feel so fortunate. They run the company, it is their business. And at 83 years old, I'm 83 this month anyway, I get to shake hands with, with all the people and kiss the babies and, <laughs> and just, be a, just be a legend, you know, it's pretty cool. Being is like a dad, you know, kind of to me. Uh, and, and, and I just, I just love the guy. Aloha Bing. <laughs> I hope that was good enough for you. Got it. Got it. Who's in charge of editing? That's me. What are you doing? You're just carrying stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name's Greg Knoll. I'm 80 fucking two years old, I can't believe it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Bing. Bing was a good surfer. He had a, a really smooth style. God, I hate to say all these good things about him, but you owe me, Bing, if you see this. What did I miss? <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> Abba-dabba-doo. No, I'm just trying to think of how brilliant to be. I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> That's about it. I think I talked enough. Yeah, I agree. Let's stop. <laughs> am, I, am I wired into this? Yeah, yeah, I'll get it. That's a wrap. Whew.